Verse 9. And then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. Or we can say, be separated into one place. Again, separation. It's almost as though God's only interested in separation. You see, it's so interesting to see this because a lot of people today have the idea that when you ask some believers to separate out from other Christians, they think that you're an agent of the devil. Only the devil brings separation, brother. Only the devil brings division. Well, I say turn to the first page of the Bible and every day you find God separating. He's separating, he's separating, he's separating. All the time he's separating. He separated the light from the darkness. He separated the waters above the heavens from the waters below the heavens. And then he separated the dry land from the earth. That's what we see here in verse 9. Separation, separation, separation. And God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into the one place and let the dry land be separated from the waters appear. And the dry land God called earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. He saw that this separation is good. We can also say that this is also a picture of resurrection. The earth coming up out of the waters is a picture of resurrection. And so we find that this separation, resurrection principle is there right in the very first page of scripture. Let the earth come up out of the seas. The seas are a picture of judgment, a picture of God's judgment on the earth, a picture of separation from God. That's why you, it's a very interesting thing, when you come, have you noticed this, that when you come to the new creation in Revelation 21, uh, verse 1, have you noticed this? Revelation 21, verse 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Do you know that in the new earth there won't be any seas? There won't be any seas. No, those seas are a picture of God's judgment. And out of that judgment, the dry land appeared a picture of resurrection. And we see further. And the earth brought forth vegetation, verse 12. Plants yielding seed after their kind. Genesis 1.12. Trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. What do you learn from the seed? We learn from the seed what Jesus said about the seed. Except a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. Again, death and resurrection. When God created those trees, he put into it seed that would have to die in order to grow up to be a tree again. I just want you to notice this, that this principle of separation and death and resurrection is there right from the first page of scripture. And that is why in the church, we proclaim separation from human traditions, separation from worldliness, and dying and being raised up constantly. Because that is what the Bible is all about, right from the very first page. Verse 13, and there was evening and there was morning a third day. Verse 14, and then God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens. Again, we find the word to separate. You never seem to get away from this word. To separate the night from the day. It's almost as though God is laboring the point to emphasize separation, separation, separation. God is light. There is no darkness in him. Separation, separation, separation. God saw and he separated the day from the night and he set light in the expanse of the heavens and let them be for signs for seasons for days and for years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light on the earth and for so and God made two great lights the greater light we know that is the sun to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night we know that's the moon and we can say the sun and the moon are a picture of Christ and the church it's a very beautiful picture of Christ and the church because the sun has light in itself like Jesus Christ and the moon does not have light in itself but reflects the light of the sun just like the church. 
And just like God has placed the sun to give light, he's also placed the moon to give light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he told the church, you are the light of the world. And the other thing we see here is the principle of rulership and authority. The sun was made to rule the day. And verse 16, and the moon was made to rule the night. Jesus Christ has been called to rule and the church has also been called to rule in a lesser way but also to rule. He made the stars also. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. A picture of Christ and the church. Authority and separation again. And now verse um, 18, to govern the day and the night, to separate the light. Again the word separate. Very interesting to see the emphasis. To separate the light from the darkness. The moon was placed to separate the light from the darkness. The sun was placed to separate the light from the darkness. The Jesus Christ came to separate the light from the darkness. The church has been placed to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. The separation of light from the darkness, God saw that it was good. The sun and the moon, they were good. And the evening and morning is the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And that, that's how all the fish and the great sea monsters and the whales and all were created. And here we find that word created. Till now it was made, 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 made. We had found created only in the first verse. In the beginning God created. But now we find that word again. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. With which the waters swarmed after that kind every winged bird. God saw that it was good. Which possibly means that in that pre-Adamic world that we read in Genesis 1. There were no fish in all likelihood. But there were probably animals in that prehistoric earth. Because when it comes to the animals, it doesn't say God created them. But he just made them. As we read in verse 25, he made the beast, but he created the fish. Notice that distinction. That there would have been probably prehistoric animals who got buried under the flood of Lucifer. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there were dinosaurs in that earth that was before the time of Adam. <laughs> Quite likely. But... Um, they all got buried and destroyed in that Luciferi Luciferian flood. But then when it came to the sea monsters, they were created 6,000 years ago. Every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind. The principle of fruitfulness. And every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And it's a very interesting word here. I was very happy to see it. And God blessed them. God blesses animals. You know that? If you've got an animal at home that's sick, you can pray for it. It says here, God blesses the animals. He blesses the winged birds and the fish. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters and the seas. And let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. And then, God said, five days are over, and now there's something very interesting. I don't know whether you all know that, that God created animals and man on the same day. Did you know that? Animals were created on the sixth day, man was also created on the sixth day. To teach man a lesson, if you don't live by the spirit, you'll end up as an animal. And that's what's happened to man all over the face of the earth. Because they have not lived by the witness of the spirit, they have ended up like animals. We can say there's one characteristic of animals. They are only occupied with earthly things. No animal, if you, no animal will kneel down and pray. <laughs> that's, you, can, you never find an animal interest in things like that. What's animal interested in? Food. And when a man is interested in food, that's a big thing in his life. What's the difference between him and an animal? 
It's just like a dog running after a bone. Sex. Animals are interested. Men. Sleep. These are the things animals are interested in. And when the men are interested in these things, take care of our little ones, my family. Take care of my family, feed them, nurture them. Animals do that. In fact, animals, many animals do a better job than many human beings. These are not the marks of a man of God. Never forget, God made animals and man on the same day so that man will never forget. He can descend to the level of an animal in no time. It's just a few hours that separate him from the animal. Not even one day. On the sixth day, God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, On the same day, after he had made the animals, maybe he made the animals in the evening, and in the morning, after the night was over, the second part of the sixth day, it was evening and morning, you see, um, he makes man. Let us make man in our image. Now comes a difference. When it comes to man, he doesn't just say, let man be made. There is a discussion in the Trinity. And you find this word, us, not let me, showing us that God is plural. Not singular. More than one person in the Godhead. Let us. There's a discussion going on in the Trinity. A council before man is made. Showing the importance of man now. Now God is coming to the crowning part of his creation. Let us make man in our image. In the image of God. According to our likeness. Notice the emphasis there. Our image, our likeness. And let them rule. What do we see here? First of all, God created man so that he might be like God. And when I don't make that the number one ambition in my life, I descend to the level of an animal. When I don't make Christ-likeness the number one goal in my life, I must remember that I was made on the same day as the animals. It's very easy to descend to that level. But between the animals and me, what do we read there? Between the creation of the animals in verse... Sorry, not the creation. Between the making of the animals in verse 25, and again that word created, verse 27... God created man. Again, something created. Never created before. Creation means for the first time. The body was made from the dust. We know that. But the man, that living soul inside, was created. We can say the house in which the man lived was not created. That was made from the dust of the earth. But the man himself, who lives in that house, was created. And between... The making of the animals in verse 25 and the creation of man in verse 27. What do we read? There's just one verse here and it's very important to see this because this is what makes the difference between man and the animals. It is only when we have revelation on this verse and are gripped by it that we understand how God has made us different from the animals. What is that? The animals were made in verse 25. Verse 27, God created man. But between them we read this verse. God said, let us make man in our image. It is that likeness to God in our spirit that makes us different from the animals. And unless we see this, we will not make this the primary thing in our Christian life. Are you gripped by the fact, my brothers and sisters, that the primary thing in the Christian life is not evangelism, it's not speaking in tongues, it's not 
doing this, that, and the other for God, but it is transformation into God's likeness, into the likeness of Christ. Unless I see this as the primary thing, it's easy to descend to the level of the animals, even though I may be doing so many other good things. If I think education and sport and all these things are the main things in life, it's easy to descend to the level of the animals. These things are all all right, but if I don't make Christ-likeness the primary thing, the primary goal of my life, then I shall descend to the level of the animals. It's possible to engage in evangelism and be an animal as far as our behavior is concerned. It's possible to speak in tongues and be an animal as far as our behavior is concerned. No, God intends that sanctification, transformation into Christ-likeness, should be the primary thing in our life. And we see here, God said in verse 26, let us make man in our image. Notice us, the Trinity there, our image. And God has made man, God himself is plural, and man is plural in being man and woman. God said, let us make man, but he made man and woman according to his likeness. And then he said, let them rule. Let us make man in our likeness and let them rule. There were two things that God desired for man. One, that he should reflect the likeness of God. And the other, that he should rule as a king on behalf of God in the sphere in which God had given him authority. There are two things that God desires for us. To become like him and to have authority in our life. And Jesus has come to redeem us from the pit into which Adam fell and to bring us back to the original purpose that God had for man. And we see here what that is. To be like him and to have authority, to rule. And the measure in which we can rule and have authority is dependent on the measure in which we have the likeness of God in us. These two things are related. They are proportionate to each other. I have authority in proportion as I have likeness to Christ in my character. Jesus had authority over everything. Everything was under his feet because he was perfectly like his Father. And in the measure in which I become like Christ, in that measure, I will also have things under my feet. But we see something here, that this is God's desire, that we might have everything under our feet. Turn to Hebrews in chapter 2 and see what we read there. Hebrews chapter 2 we read, Speaking about Jesus, Thou hast made him a little low, while lower than the angels, that's man. And yet, the verse 8, Hebrews 2, 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. This was God's original purpose for Adam. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing out that was not subject to him, but now... We do not yet see all things subjected to him. No, we see man not yet having all the authority that God intended him to have. But we do see him, that is Jesus, who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death. And everything is under his feet. And we are to be members of his body in the church. And everything is to be under our feet. Wonderful to see this. You know, my brothers and sisters, that it's God's desire that not only you should have his likeness, but having his likeness that you should rule, that you should rule over your circumstances, that you should never allow your circumstances to get on top of you and depress you and crush you and make you miserable and full of self-pity and gloomy. No, it is God's will that you rule over your circumstances. It's God's will that you rule over sin. It's God's will that you rule over fear. It is not the will of God that you should be a slave. You know that, brothers and sisters, it's not God's will that you should be a slave, that you should be a slave to sin or to people's opinions or to fear or to any dirty habit. No. See what we read here. God said, let us make man and let them rule, man and woman. God wants us to rule and to have authority over everything by faith, overcoming. This is God's will. We see that way back in Genesis chapter 1 itself. And we read, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. There is a partnership there, we shall think about it more as we come to chapter 2, 
that the image of God could not be reflected by a man alone, but by a man plus a woman. It's good for husbands and wives to recognize that. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful. God wants us to be fruitful in our days spiritually and multiply to have spiritual seed. Fill the earth and subdue it. Again, subdue means to rule over and to crush and put under your feet. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth. God made man a vegetarian in the beginning. He became a non-vegetarian only in the days of Noah. And every tree which is fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you and to every beast of the earth to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life I have given every green plant for food and it was so and God saw that all that he had made and behold it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day I just want to mention one thing here in relation to verse 29 that when God sorry verse 28 when God said be fruitful that was obviously through Adam and Eve coming together as husband and wife and that teaches us that there is nothing wrong in the sexual function that God has given to man that is perfectly good it was created by God blessed by God before sin ever came to the earth and it's very important for us to see it because there's so much of perversion and wrong understanding of this in the world today and at the end of it all including all these things we considered it says here that God saw it was very good Up to the fifth day it was good, but when God finally created man, that is man and woman in his image, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, verse 31, and the sixth day.